All right, welcome to Witch Police Radio. I'm in my uh, dark basement, as, as I have been for most of the pandemic, and uh, I'm recording an interview today with someone who's been on the show a few times before, and who is really, uh, I feel like over the course of doing this podcast, I've had a lot of people on the show, obviously, over 600 plus episodes, and there's, I kind of have this mental list of people that are welcome back on whenever, uh, just because I, I feel the conversations are really good, and the music is really good, too, so the guest on this episode is, is on that list, that, that non-existent mental list of basically, you know, you want to come back on the show, you're welcome anytime, so I'm here with Del Barber, who is, uh, you know, I think you're pretty well known within Winnipeg and within the community that listens to this podcast, but maybe the best way to kind of formally kick this off is if you want to just introduce yourself and maybe give a bit of background about what it is that you do musically. Yeah, my name is Del Barber. I, uh, I've been uh, doing this for my living for the most part for the last decade. And I feel like, I guess I'd call myself a storyteller first and foremost, uh, through music yeah Um, I don't really I try to avoid talking about my own life um, in song I try to I try to like use songs as a way to empathize and a way to sort of make statements about the world that is a little more soft and I that I hope can I, I just think there's a potential in bringing more people together instead of separating them uh through songs that that like use parable or story yeah. this way. So that's like my entire, that's my goal. I don't, I don't think that I achieve it as well as, as I could. Um, but that's like what sort of my mission statement or what I'm like working towards is to try and make those sort of like, uh, you know, softer political statements through, through other people's stories, yeah. you know, um, and, and try to not to patronize them necessarily or fictionalize them too badly, but, but, but try and describe the world that they're in um, so that we can feel some sort of sense of empathy. That's what I want to do. Well, I think that's kind of what you're known for too, is, is that you have very strong characters and settings and, um, and storytelling, like you said, at the outset, I mean, that's sort of your, your, your whole bag, right. Is, is um, like you said, t- telling, evoking feelings and emotions and, and concepts through the stories of other people in, in very uniquely prairie settings. So um yeah, which which that, isn't to say that that I that I really that I think it's like a better art form or something. It's just the thing that that I've decided to work at. Sure. Like I think I wish in some ways I wish I could be better at sort of mining my feeling or perspective on the world and and uh, delivering it um, delivering it in such a way that 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 could move people. But I, I don't feel good about it when it has more of my perspective on it. And I guess that's why these songs for me have fallen into like a B-sides category. You know? Yeah. And that's maybe a good segue into, into kind of what we're talking about today is that you have this new record coming out and it's a collection of uh, B-sides. So this is your first album like this where you've kind of collected, yeah. uh, I don't want to say throwaway songs, because obviously they're not, but what I guess what has made these songs the ones that you've chosen for, for this record? Because I imagine you have a lot of stuff you've recorded over this, this lifetime of, of working as a musician that you haven't, for whatever reason, put out on, on, on a, a formal release, right? So what's the uh, kind of, why these songs? Well, yeah, I, I had like this period of writer's block, I guess. The first period I ever had, I was like, just you know, pandemic hits, I didn't know what I was doing. And I felt like I had nothing to say for the first time. Um, I wasn't traveling all the time. I wasn't being introduced to all these strange people. So I wasn't like finding inspiration um, when I was at my most aware, you know, when I'm like traveling, when I'm in gas stations, when I'm in these places, I feel like I'm just like, I have a more, I have a more acute attention to, to like, a person's face or like the way they uh you know like just proclivities you know that that really inspire songs that inspire me to like ask a stranger a question uh to be that bold to like get backstory and so i just decided that i was gonna work my way through the writer's block and it wasn't working at all. Like I would go, I had built a studio in, in, in uh, this one car garage in my little farm and I would go out there in the morning 
and I would devote two hours to writing songs. And before this would be a regular practice, I would just like devote time to write and then I would write and something would happen. Sometimes I had to grind a little bit, but for yeah. the most part I could like, I could get somewhere and I was getting nowhere. And so like to procrastinate, I started looking through old songs, old notebooks, dozens of old notebooks, like just started bringing in another old notebook into the studio every other day. And I started realizing like, man, there's been so many things that I'd forgotten about. It was like this crazy feeling of like, um, the metaphor I've been, I've been using a lot lately is like, you, when you put an old coat on okay. and there's a fit, there's like a 20 or a $50 bill in there that you had, you just completely forgot about. Like you, you, you earned that money somewhere. Right. But it like, and for me to like have lost a $50 bill is like an impossible thing. Cause I'm usually broke, but that goes to the territory, felt. right? Of a professional musician. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's just like, that's, that's how it felt. It just felt like I found, I, I kept finding money in my old jackets Cool. in, and, it, and there were songs that were like, man, these are, there's some real potential here. And then I worked through all these old songs. I worked through like 30 or 40 of them. And I like had all these songs and I was like, man, I got to record this. And in the process of doing that, I started paying attention, just like something switched. I started paying attention to my locality more and some of those characters more and people that I've been trying to write about, but I was sort of, I wasn't giving myself the liberty to. And, okay. and then within like two weeks after I had these 30 or 40 songs for the B-sides, I had another album written, oh, which wow. I haven't recorded yet. But it was like this process of like, going through my memories, like fiddling with memories and like looking back on 10 years and having the time and space to just like look back, uh, like contemplate all of the places and, and yeah. strange people and like do it in a slower way. Uh, I found all these old songs. I fixed some of them up, like some of them, some of them weren't working very well. Well, that's uh, why they didn't get them, recorded in the first place, I guess, right? Yeah. And, and some of them were like, I had recorded them. And, and they just didn't fit on a record. Like I loved the song, but I'm just like, I couldn't see it. And it's like, it's silly. Cause I, I'm like, I'm realizing like, man, some of these songs should have come out. They would have done a lot better, <laughs> but I just had these like particular visions for records that I, that I couldn't shake. And then I needed, I needed to like make a statement that was like whole and not that anyone cares about that, but me or very few people, like maybe you. Yeah, I but probably like, do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. and I mean, like there's, that's, those are the artists that I always have looked up to who are trying to make sure. bigger statements and say something, you know, in a, a just, a slightly more nuanced way through multiple songs and have the same characters appear on the same record uh stuff like that and and so these songs just sort of got and my propensity for to forget is i also learned is like very great <laughs> and 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 disappointing right you know? right uh, <laughs> But yeah, it was like, it was a joy to like be, to use that sort of spark to be able to figure out who I was again. And, and it was sort of, a, 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 I allowed myself to, to do some self uh, reflection um, and, and something that I would probably have criticized as being um, a, a, the, the desire to constantly self reflect in our society is, is, a, a largely a product of ego uh sure in my opinion and it's and it's a sign that you think highly of yourself or a person that one thinks highly of themselves not that there can't be lots of good stuff that comes from it yeah but i just got into that headspace and whether it was my ego that was driving it or not i don't know but i do like the result of it in terms of like i, I don't feel like the songs came across as to a person who was too sure of themselves which is all which always worries me when someone's too sure of themselves. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, wanna, it's almost a good you know. thing when someone isn't, right? Because there's that kind of rawness that comes through and, and honesty as well when someone's not kind of, like you said, too sure of themselves. They're not thinking too far ahead about what this song will mean to the listener and things like that. If it's, if it's just something that's kind of like, you know, sincere and, and fully yeah. formed out of your brain, I guess it makes a, it has a different vibe, right? I mean, the people, the people and, and the things even and like landscapes that, that inspire me the most have like have this like just depth of humility to them and like i want to model myself after that like i want to i want to 
be a person that looks like the prairies. Like that's how I'm, yeah. I want my music to sound. And as diverse as that can be, someone can can look at it and not see it. Um, and I think that's like my favorite part about the prairies or our landscape is that it's easy to look past um, or maybe it's hard to look past and it's easy to see through or something like that. There's something there anyway. And um, that to try and like cultivate a subtlety, like, yeah. It's, it's hard, but I think it's something you can practice, like you can get better at. And I think the prairies are really good at that. And I think like the landscape is, and I think that in some ways informs us, you know, as people that are, that are from here and it, and it informs our art for sure. And, and I just want to like intentionally try and do that as much as possible. Um, well, I, yeah, I often I wonder know. if that the humility side of things, I, mean, I agree with you on the prairies for sure. And I, I don't think I would be doing the show as long as I have if I wasn't kind of mystified by, you know, the way that people portray this part of the world in music, in music form. But yeah. I often wonder if maybe the, the humility thing, like maybe people from the prairies are too humble. Um, well, it's almost like a detriment because, you know, we're always looking down on ourselves and not realizing maybe the greatness of this part of the world. I mean, we, we do eventually, but <laughs> there's a few steps like leading to that, right? And do you think that that could be maybe a detriment uh, as far as writing too, as not recognizing that a song has this potential because you're trying to have that humility? I, yeah, I def it's gotta be, it's gotta be a detriment. Um, and, and that's, that's like a very uh, humble perspective to have. Right. Like when, it's like when we look at any political action, like uh, there are, there are a pile of movements that I'm excited about and I'm, I'm seeing like, it seems like I'm seeing change happen and things my community has been talking about. Yeah. Especially like on the left for a very long time. Um, but when change happens, we get so excited about seeing the possibility for good that we, we sort of forget to realize that there are probably going to be some negative repercussions with those as well, that we're not really willing to narrate at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Because in, in, and I think that that, overall is a strength uh in terms of like anesthetic if you want to like see the, the prairie person as an aesthetic the the ability to like understand that that's a detriment um just going back to your to your point about like uh not having the the sort of brute confidence to to just stand behind what you're saying or yeah. like um have that pride um there's always a hesitation right yeah, to know that that what you're saying is important and that where you're from is important. I think that you're completely correct in saying that it's like it is entirely detrimental, but I think that ends up working uh, working for us because I I don't think that that we don't realize that it's a detriment. Like I think that there's a self-awareness uh, um, that we that there are better that there are better things out there sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those other places like the New Yorks and the LA's just, that's not a part of the, the framework or aesthetic whatsoever. Um, it's hard to believe there's anywhere else sometimes. For, even places. Toronto, for example, too, right? I mean, if you're going with yeah. Canadian, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think that like growing up in the prairies, it's really easy to believe there's someone else, there's somewhere else. You sure. Know? Because a lot of people want to escape oh. to somewhere else. They always come back, but, but there's, there's a desire right, to, uh, to to pack up and, and leave as soon as you can. And then that's, I think, when people realize what they're missing and, and what they left behind here. I think it was like, I've been thinking about this metaphor of like a, a like relationship with place and like to like, like think about it as a marriage to like a partner. And mm -hmm. I don't want to be a person who thinks they're immune uh, to divorce. I think it will make my marriage better. And like to think that I'm above the possibility of it coming undone, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I believe in my marriage and I'm like, I'm like fully committed and we, we're, we're about to have our second kid. And awesome. um, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> I'm freaking out actually. About it. But, uh, but yeah, so I just think that like to, to, to realize that like it forces me to check in more uh, with her um not, I mean, we're, we're not perfect by any means. Uh, nobody is. Nobody is. Yeah. But, but, um, but I, like to try and enter relationships with place with that, with that kind of humility, when you're in a good, healthy relationship that you realize like, 
you don't just get to have this forever necessarily. You need to work on it. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that metaphor works with place as well on some level. Well, just to kind of, um, sorry, go ahead, Bill, if you had, if you had more. No, 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 not, not at all, no. I was going to say, you know, you're looking back at these old songs and um, obviously you're in a different, like you just said, like you're, you're about to have a second kid. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You're already a father. Uh, things have changed, obviously, in your life since 10 years ago or whenever you wrote some of these songs originally or these ideas. How yeah. does that kind of uh, backwards reflection um, work for you now? Do you, are you seeing ideas you had 10 years ago before all this stuff and uh, sort of reflecting on them as your current self with all of the life experience? And, and does that make you kind of, um, are you having to rework some of these ideas through that lens or or what? Yeah, absolutely. So, so some of these songs were like fully formed. Okay. Uh, stuff that, uh, you know, I maybe change a word here and there. I change melodies at will. Uh, didn't really have any idea of like, production or tempos they were all rough demos but some of them were fully formed and some of them were a few years old there was a couple off the easy keeper sessions that i didn't put on a um, couple off periography um and then I, I basically a few off all the sessions and then some that were just like completely out there and then one new new song i wrote the first song i wrote after my writer's block uh, meantime the first single that came out oh cool um it was brand new like i just i wrote that in like 20 minutes one of those songs it was just like here you go you can have this one and <laughs> that was it and and so like it's kind of all over the map but but yeah like i do think they they all feel new to me um they all sort of uh yeah some of them were just like discovered uh unearthed and some of them had been just kicking around in my head and i just couldn't shake them okay um so it's like kind of all over the map and and then trying to like curate 10 or nine or whatever ends up being on the on the release depending if a person buys vinyl or gets it digitally right uh, there'll, there'll be a different amount of songs on the on the record there'll be a couple more i think but yeah I, like it was hard to figure out which songs to put on there but it ended up being uh going to the studio or go, we did it at a cabin like in quarantine style yeah 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 um brought an engineer in and, 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 uh, like did it beautifully, I think, but, um, it was sort of as a result of like what worked right now in the studio. So we got, we only had four days and it was like, it was an, an amazing, uh, amount of fun to like will down this list and to just, if it sounded good and played naturally and everybody in the room, liked the song, we went with it. And I, I got to kind of control and had some idea of like what I thought was going to work. Okay. Um, but it felt like it felt like whittling a mountain down into into a hill, and uh, and I think I just tried to let the studio do that for me instead of instead of having a sort of ultimate plan beforehand. You know? Would this have happened if there were, if the pandemic didn't happen? I don't think so. No, I I can't imagine it happening. I would have had to come up with a record, uh, and I could have recorded it. Uh, you know in that time mm -hmm. whether or not it would have done it or would have been good but i can't see i can't see ever having the time to go through all those songs just um, just to, just to find the ones you just to get that list whittled down like you said right? just to just to have the luxury of time like just absolute silence and time and no one's coming over no one's yeah. stopping by i don't have to go anywhere yeah um it was like a very eerie sense of of slowing down that i that was sort of like uh, t tough to swallow at first, but then I really ended up leaning into it and, yeah. uh, and really finding life in it. And, and I think that's when all these songs started to make sense, you know? Well, I think you're, you know, over the course of doing the show, I talk to people who are at very different levels of success in their musical careers. Some of them are basically a basement band that plays, you know, once a week or whatever. And then you're doing yeah. this. I mean, you're, you're the opposite here in that this is your this is your career. You're doing this, you know, full time. So obviously the pandemic has affected you. It's affected everyone. I, I, I'm sick of asking people <laughs> how they're dealing yeah. with it because every single episode <laughs> of the past two years or whatever, I've been, I've been talking about it. But what, what is I mean, it sounds like you've kind of found a way to make make yourself productive during this this time frame uh, with this record that you're putting out and with going through these old songs and everything but what what does it look like i guess for you when things sort of clear up i know you have some shows that are 
booked in the future. Um, yeah. But what, how do you get back into it? I guess, do you have a strategy of how to just sort of approach the music industry being a thing again after this sort of long layoff? Oh man, I'm pretty afraid. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't want to like, I mean, the, the pandemic has been a terrible pain in the ass, like financially for me. Sure. Uh, but, and, and some probably what somewhat professionally, like, like easy keeper was like, just going to get be released in the UK. And I was like going to be in Europe in the summer and I had all these great shows lined up. So there was like a lot of things that were on the horizon that were like, that were, I was, that felt like the, the train was gaining steam again. Yeah. You know, we had talked about in the past, things kind of went sour for me for a bit and I had to really work to get this train out of the station and to get it moving and it was moving. And just as it was starting to like hit highway speed, it was like, that's it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was like, oh, okay. But, but all that being said, like, and I, I don't, I don't want to like put anybody off by seeing how much good came out of this last two years for me for for my family for yeah for my writing um it's like professors taking sabbatical it was like a forced sabbatical in and i was just like i feel very lucky to to have gotten to you know have enough to get by on and and um make our life smaller and quieter for a bit and, yeah. and so like and there's parts of that that i don't really want to change anymore like a lot of us like we you know, and, and we're watching them sort of drift away. Those changes we thought we could make permanently, they're just sort of disappearing again really quickly. Yeah. And I think I really want to try and um, keep some of those things close if I can. And I want to tour intentionally and well, and uh, I don't want to do anything that is meaningless anymore. And I, I didn't before, but I had the propensity to just say yes to everything. And right. I guess in the next 10 years of my career, if I'm so lucky to have it, I want to develop the muscle that is no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be able to say no to, to things that stink, like to things that I know aren't going to work. Um, uh, there's there's obviously a time and a place to, to do things you don't want to do. There's That's a true every day. Sure. Um, it's unavoidable. But but to do the things that are really not going to amount to anything because because you you think you should or you don't want to let someone down um there's moments where i want to learn how to say no and i think that hopefully that i can reclaim some of this lifestyle through that um uh, that's probably a pipe dream but yeah that's that's what i want to do well it's just not it's not a bad dream to have though right i mean it's, it's a pretty good goal to, to to have where you actually have sort of more control over the way your your life and your career which are intertwined is going to go yeah, and even even since Easy Keeper, like even before this, uh, when my last record Easy Keeper came out, um, it was, I felt like I got to be in control of my career for the first time in yeah. a long time, and uh, and it was just so freeing, you know. It was just like it was like this is what it was like when I started. Like I, I could, I could take, I could take the shows I needed to take, you know, and and I could. You know, I just felt like I had some control back. I didn't feel like people were looking at me and not trusting what I wanted to do artistically. And that's yeah. the main thing. That's like the main thing that got away from me. That's like the thing that shouldn't get away from an artist. And, uh, and it didn't do me any favors, you know, like people having to, to call my team to get a hold of me for something. It's like bullshit. Like that's <laughs> just like for what I do and like folk music and roots music, like if you want me to do some mask and, and, yeah. and if I feel like do it, I'm going to do it, man. Like, uh, yeah, I just, I just have a great sense of shame for some of those years <laughs> where, where I, I probably pissed some people off and I didn't even know it, you know? Yeah. Uh, just Although that probably wasn't, it probably wasn't your fault though, right? It's probably just more of this situation you were in. And, uh, I mean, yeah, but you still make those decisions. Sure. And you think it's sure. the right thing, but you just insulate yourself from, from being like, uh, having personal relationships with, with these people that are working for you, like that are right. that are, like yourself, like they're like, t they're taking their personal time to like promote music or, or, or a show or, um, whatever. And, 
and they can't even talk to you like it's weird yeah it's weird and it, and and it ha it happen I'm seeing it happen with with people that are rising up right now. Like I just I'm see I'm seeing it over and over again through them. And I hope that like maybe they'll reach a level where they need that insulation. Like there when you get to a certain level of like real success or fame, you probably yeah. need insulation for just like sanity and safety. Just you know? to control everything. And, I'm, yeah. and I, I don't I'm not there, and I don't think I'll ever get there. I don't have like the voice golden voice for radio. I'm not, I don't make any. Uh, bones about it but but i do i want to be as accessible as possible and like uh and just available uh for those relationships and, and that's the thing is like trying to tour and be around in a town for more than a day so you can yeah. actually like see these old friends that like put on your first shows and like just be, just be around them and see how they're doing and like be their friend because they've been yours and you haven't done it back like it's, it's <laughs> just like real problem with reciprocity that that sure we experience we end up just becoming leeches out there uh, we just suck people dry and then leave town <laughs> and, <laughs> and go to the next I town just, do the same thing i, yeah. just, I yeah. can't do it anymore man yeah. I, I i i just there's too many important people out there in my life now that that i want to spend time with and, yeah and i think some of them still want to spend time with me so <laughs> it works did the um response to easy keeper i mean from what i understand anyway easy keeper got a pretty good uh, critical response and I, I love the record i saw a lot of really good reviews for it um did that is that a bit of a payoff for kind of going in there and doing that one on your own terms and seeing the reaction to it because i, I guess the one before that was the hockey record right which yeah, that's right. which i like yeah. but I, I don't know how, yeah, how like well it. Like beloved it, it is outside of me and a few other people right so was yeah, that... there's, there's a lot of people that hate it right i think it's um, awesome but yeah yeah I like it too. Thank uh, you. Good, good. <laughs> but was it? Did that feel like gratifying though to know that you had, you know, done this kind of in the the, the old way without sort of all of the uh, the trappings, I guess, uh, of of industry, and to get a positive reaction and get kind of the recognition for that record being a, a good record. Yeah, dude, it was a complete shock. Like it was, uh, it was. There were like supporters of me and like my aesthetic and brand that like came out of the woodwork like jonathan bernstein from the rolling stone uh yeah that was cool to see you in there yeah and he he like s sent an email and was like yo what like what's going on have you been doing anything i'm like uh what who are you <laughs> it's like oh, yeah, i've been a fan since this record i'm like okay um yeah i want to cover this record i sent him the record and he's like oh yeah we'll do a feature on it it's like this well. is like like to me that's like the holy grail you of know, course like yeah. that's the thing it wasn't like the print edition or anything but still, but it, was still it doesn't like, matter your name is in rolling stone yeah it was, it was massive for me it was like yeah. massive to realize that there were supporters out there that i had no idea about and uh, at at that level uh, it did i thought because before some of those people came out of the woodwork i thought i was dead in the water like i mm -hmm. was like why should people care i'm like a white 30 something you know uh there's just so many of us with guitars just singing <laughs> songs like it's like this again you know yeah, yeah. and um yeah i it, it really <laughs> it fueled me man like that that the response from that record um was far greater than i would have ever imagined uh i was just hoping it was going to allow me to just sort of slowly continue doing this you know and but it probably would have if not for the uh, pandemic yeah, and it's still dead. Like it's still dead. I was still I was selling records through the pandemic, like shipping records off, and people like, man, people bought merch. Like, they really supported us through this. Like, uh, also shocked by that. So like, yeah. there's just so many silver linings to that, that few years for me that um, that I I just don't want to lose sight of, man. For sure, for sure. So when is the actual record coming out? The B-side. Oh, record? I don't know. August. <laughs> I think late August. Late August? Okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a date. Um, but you can play anything you want from it on this show. If cool. You like. Cool. Yeah, there's it's up to me. <laughs> yeah, it is up to you. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Right on. So, That's nice though, yeah. right? To have that to be in that position. Not not just for this show, but to, just the idea that, you know, the record comes out when it comes out and it's up to you to 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 handle everything, yeah. Yeah, I mean I get to make the calls and people support my calls. Like I do have a little team assembled. Like there's just there's enough work now where and I can afford to pay a manager a little bit. Yeah. Um and just like utilize some of the grants and um and then there's like I have a record label that 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 don't control anything. They're mostly mostly just 
um, on distribution. Okay. Um, and like trying to figure out how to how to use streaming to our advantage in the music business. I don't understand how streaming works. Yeah. Um, I don't understand how playlists work. It's like moon language. It's, it's, it's insane. Yeah, totally. There's like, you know, there's playlists and you're supposed to want to get on them and you're supposed to do everything you can to satisfy these massive corporations so that you can get on those playlists. Um, and a lot of the things that I'm doing right now, I feel very weird about, to be honest, like, mm-hmm. they're like, Hey, you need to thank the DSPs, the digital service providers for adding you to their playlists. I'm like, so I'm using my social media to like thank the devil. Like <laughs> that's how it feels. Yeah, sure, um, sure. Yeah. Um, and but I am thankful to that people are listening. So like yeah. it's not like I'm not thankful, but I am like a bit weary of like thanking Spotify and, and Apple Music and stuff, even though I, you know, I, I, I use Apple Music now. I begrudgingly became a streamer. Um I'm not there yet. Yeah. Hold no, hold no as long as I can. I just decided to do it so I could figure out like how to be better at it. And if, if there's a way to do it well, like without feeling like a total grease bag, cause it's like, I was participating in it. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know how it sure. worked. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Like when I, fa- yeah. <laughs> I mean, I found old, but like when I found out that you couldn't buy songs on iTunes anymore, I was like, what do you, you buy? can't really, I, I actually didn't know so. you could know. That's, that's news to me. Well, maybe <laughs> like listeners might correct me, but I'm pretty sure that it's just completely streaming now. Oh, wow. You can't like buy a song for a buck anymore. Um, it just exists somewhere far away on some the server. Magical in cloud, the yeah. yeah. And and you just get to access it whenever you want, but paying a, a, a monthly. Um, and they make all the money. And uh, But all that being said is there's a lot of lobbying being done especially in Canada. There's some really great musicians who are lobbying for us uh, for streaming uh, royalties to go up, which which would really help like sure those those basement bands who, who can like get a little bit of like a Spotify, a couple Spotify playlists and actually make money from it. Um, and then they can go to the next level based on just having that bit of success will boost yeah. them to the next next step. Yeah. And it, and like some of those some of those playlists, like it really does introduce their like like I like the same conversation we had before is like despite the fact that I sound sort of like preaching doomsday about streaming, uh, there are loads of benefits. There are people that will access your music uh, if you can get past the tastemakers at Spotify and stuff. They, they, people will access your music that 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 just would never have heard it before. Yeah. Um, it's like presented in a really slick way and there so there's there's definitely pros and cons to it man well that's kind of the, yeah. the goal now not maybe not the goal but that's how people succeed now is they just the right person hears it and then shares it with whatever their audience is and then it kind of trickles down from there right it seems like that's a that's happening yeah um i still hope that i can just go and get you know get in front of people and get yeah. them after the show and uh treat it more like like a, like a politician would. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shaking hands, kissing babies. I, yeah. My friend Blake, uh, he went door to door selling records okay. when he was starting out in Did Regina. that work? Yeah, it worked. I mean, I don't know how many he actually sold, but he, he says he sold like 4,000 records. I think I would buy a record from someone who came to my house just because it would be I so unexpected. And, and when he told me he did that, I was like, man, that's greasy. He's like, dude, our politicians go door to door and we have way more to say than them. And I was like, oh yeah, True. okay. Maybe you have a point. <laughs> I'm not at the point where I'm ready to go door to door. I'm like too scared. But uh, but I do I do want to see it as, as when you're on the road, you should be like there for people. Um, yeah. And, and I'm like, um, I characterize myself as an introvert, but I don't have any problem uh, with confidence. Sure. Um, I don't get energy from people, but when I'm working and I'm on the road, um, I can generally, uh, turn the table and ask them a bunch of questions instead of having to talk about me. Yeah. Most yeah. people are pretty ready to talk to an artist after the show. And especially if I start asking questions about their lives, um, I, I'm interested and I can actually engage on that level. Um, I just can't, I can't engage when I have to repeat the same thing every night. We're yeah, that makes, on that tour, makes sense. you know. Yeah, and they're just really. I've just gotten really good at, at like having real conversations with people that aren't 
the after shows and, and I'm just finding that like the most important part of my business. Like the most important part of my job is those personal relationships. And I, I think that I want to try to do that going forward, like as one of my main sort of stays. That makes sense for someone who does this type of songwriting that you do too, because I think it's um like one of the big, we've probably talked about this before, but one of the biggest uh, down uh, negative, I guess, aspects of streaming is that people are so, their attention span is non-existent. And yeah. I, I feel like your music is something that rewards kind of close listening. And when you're in that setting so. where you're where you're face to face with them and they're kind of absorbing what you're putting out there, I think they're maybe more likely to to respond to it in the same way, right? I think that there is. I think you're right. There's like a disconnect uh, between like the creator and the, the listener. Yeah, because it uh, and like a, it's a just lot of times it's the intentional. It's, okay. Yeah, yeah, a yeah, lot yeah, of times yeah. it it could be intentional, like the mystery of of certain types of music, like not like having those sort of the mystical poet uh, archetype or sure or like um that's like the opposite of who i want to be seen as i want i want people to understand what i'm talking about and, and i want them to 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 get different things out of listening to the record and like be nuanced and because everybody is and um, not to think hi more highly of myself than anyone else but to just sort of like show that sort of depth of humanity into my music like yeah uh, and and from from the sort of um from like sonically and lyrically um and even just how the show looks and and sounds um want to get better at trying to make the show like that too uh, yeah all these things are earmarked as sort of like things that i am like actively working on and trying to like vision uh envision as like the future of of my show right and um, what it means to people. Uh, well, it seems like to make you, it mean something to people. It seems like you have a lot of those things already sort of on the go. Like you, you, you've developed, you know, your sort of personality as an artist, I think does cover a lot of those, 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 those items of the checklist. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that means like a hell of a lot, man. Um, I know you said it flippantly, but that's like everything to me. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I honestly, I honestly see this as a trade. Uh, I love seeing music as a trade. Yeah. And I, and I think like a really good carpenter or a really good teacher like knows where they can get better. Oh, of and course. That's, yeah. what makes, that's what makes them excellent. And you see the same thing in music. There's a lot of teachers who just get by every day and they make it work and they're fine. Yeah. Um, but to like be excellent at it, you have to sort of be in contact with the things you know you can be better at and figure out a way to work on them. And you're not always going to be able to work on them. You're going to have, you're going to have shit days, man. Yeah. Uh, no matter what you do, but like that carpenter knows there are certain things that he or she lacks and wants to be around the people or figure out a way to learn how to get better at them. Um, and Would not just because it's going to make them more money because they, because they like, they love getting better at what they do that's the goal. It's like to see it as that kind of trade, you know? Right. Instead of just sticking with the one thing you already know how to do well and just saying, oh, I'm going to do this forever and not, not improve or, or not, 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 not even change. Right. A lot of people, once they sort of develop a sound uh, musically anyway, like uh, a sound and a style, they kind of cookie cutter it. They phone it in. It's like, this is, you know, this is how I sound. I'm going to make the next 10 records exactly the same. And that often works for some people where, I mean, uh, it doesn't have much creativity to it, but it's sort of a, uh, like an easy money maker, I guess, for, for a lot of artists who, who've sort of found their niche, right? Yeah, and I mean, if you had that niche, it would like if I had that type of high level niche or like even just like pop popular sound or something. Yeah, it probably would be really hard to not do, and it's not fair for me to say that that I would be any better. <laughs> like if if that was just working, um, I in some ways I have the luxury of 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 being able to sort of think of this as something that can be enigmatic like can be something that uh, people aren't allowed to pin down to one thing yeah um that's like that's always been the dream for me is is to not have to fall into definite categories um or like definite subject matter uh you know, it's still going to be my voice and I play guitar. Like it, how much can it change? Like I have limits. Uh, Carpenter works with wood. 
you know, yeah. like there are, there are limits to, to what I do. And I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to start using sequencers and keyboards. I think I'm like, I think I write songs on a guitar. So like I've, I've, I've introduced limits into this equation, no matter what happens. Um, there are way, there are artists who are going to sound way more, have the ability to sound way more diverse than me record sure. to record for sure. But within, within those limits, I want to be able to go to the furthest ends uh, or at least try, you know, um, I don't know. Either way, it's, it's just like the, the, the art of it is to just like, is to be pushing yourself um, and, and to figure out what things could, could improve and, and what things you're, you know, you're, you're sure that you want to keep doing yeah. for now, you know? There's what this, about uh, you? Like, how do you feel about, about podcasting even? Like, do you feel like, are you at the level of passion where you really, it just, it seems like you're just really, you know, passionate about it. That's part of the reason why I love being on your show is because yeah, I thanks. feel like, I, I feel like you're inspired by doing this and, and you've like gotten progressively better at it. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I really appreciate that's the kind of person I want to be around. Like that's yeah. what makes us artists, you know? Yeah. Well, no, I think that it's, it's very similar with podcasting too, because I think one of the um, kind of, you know, we've been doing the, uh, I've been involved in the Manitoba Podcast Festival. We've been kind of creating a, a DIY community of local podcasters from, yeah. you know, Winnipeg and across the province. And one of the sort of standard things that comes up in some of these meetings we have and things like that is that a lot of people will try doing a podcast and they'll it's not working the way they expect it to and then they stop and they could have yeah. a fantastic idea they could be really good at, or they could have all this potential to do something great and and they they don't because it hasn't sort of uh succeeded from the first five or ten episodes and i'm at like 600 something episodes and it still isn't you know the perfect show that i want it to be but I, I think that like by continuing to do it over all these years, it, it does improve. And I'm sure if you listen to the episode we did in 2019, this is going to be a lot better just in, in general, because I've sort of figured out more what I want the direction of the show to be and then how to have these conversations and how to get, you know, stories and thoughts out of people uh, yeah. in the way that, that I, that I want to hear. Right. So. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And it's like, and even, you know, looking back on some of those episodes, you'll probably find some things you really liked um, that will like, that will, that will rekindle some fires sure. of like what you were thinking about and ab about podcasting, all those things. It's like, that's a pretty, yeah. I, I think like, I'm just such a fan of the, uh, of the podcast, like in general, like the, the, I think it's like the golden age of radio right now. It's really and, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I just think it's cool. You guys are like developing community around it in like the local uh, setting, but back to the sort of idea of like giving up too early, like having misplaced expectations of like what it's supposed to be. Um, I think if you're probably setting out to do it for success or for numbers, it's probably going to be bad. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's not something you're going to be able to continue to do because it's a lot more work than you think it is too. I think when you think you're going to have a podcast, it's like, Oh, just get my friends on and we'll talk or whatever. Yeah. And it's then like, we'll become famous. And we'll get, yeah. Spotify will buy us. Or, yeah. 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 This is a lot more work and a lot more time, uh, a, a lot more sacrifice away from family, all totally. these things uh, that then anyone out there would realize, uh, you know, doing a podcast, especially when it sounds beautiful and casual and, and, uh, um, it has that that rawness to it that some of these podcasts are sort of that's what's great about them yeah um, just that level of sincerity that's it's like it still sounds good and it's still like professional but it's it's not like slick it's not garth brooks yeah you know what i mean and no one and, wants to hear um, the garth brooks of, of podcasts though i mean i don't want to hear the garth brooks of music necessarily either i'd rather hear the del barber i'd rather hear someone who's who who is you know not at that level and has not sort of uh become a massive you know multi-billion dollar success i want to hear that the little guy who's still kind of struggling with it but doing really interesting work as a result of that struggle yeah i love it like it's like we're not tuning into podcasts to hear the like four o'clock fm radio uh trio of hosts like no no talk about the drive home uh that you know that's awful anyway and like i don't i don't know i don't think people actually enjoy it i think it's just on for people 
Um, well, I think that's maybe a big difference, you know. though, right? Is that radio? I mean, I love radio too. My my day job is in radio. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not on air, but I mean, I love radio as a medium. But I think the difference is, like you said, radio can definitely serve as as, as it's not as deliberate as podcasts because your podcast you're choosing. You're not just tuning in. You're choosing a specific uh, show, a specific episode. You're downloading it to your device or your computer or whatever. Like you actually have to take that extra step to, to choose the specific thing and 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 obtain it. Whereas radio is just always on. There's always something happening, and you can be driving, and it can be background noise. You can listen in as closely as you want to. But podcasts, I think, like like your music and like a lot of people's music that kind of I have on the show too, is it lends itself to to closer listening because it's made for that. Yeah, I love it. I think like, uh, interestingly, um, there, yeah, you, you have to sort of intentionally listen to podcasts for sure. Um, there's also like, there's something else going on with like, with people's appetite for it. Like it, it is what this is, is long form journalism. It is. Yeah. Um, without really, without like fact checking, not that like <laughs> this needs to be fact checked. I know what you mean, but, though, yeah, yeah. But because people, people have grown a distrust for media as it is, so it's not like they're going to anticipate everything we say has to be true. If we say something and they're like, they might just question it. They don't. They don't. We don't have to be an authority on anything. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's really cool that it's still long form journalism, but there isn't the authority behind it. I mean, certain subject matter you'd probably want to have an authority on on like certain podcasts about like uh, Middle Eastern affairs or something. Yeah, yeah. But it is incumbent on the listener to look that stuff up as well. Um, because we, we've come to a point where we don't even trust, we don't even trust the speed of the news. Like things have to happen too fast and the news has to get stories out too fast that they can't even, they have to issue apologies every other day for things that, that they reported that aren't simply aren't true. And, you know, there's, yeah. there's so many examples of this. It's like, we can't even get to that point. And there's not a budget in a lot of our news stations to do long form journalism. And it seems like podcasting is like taking that slack. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty exciting time for like people that like radio yeah. or like, yeah. and, and like long form stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear you. I'm glad to hear you describe it as journalism because I think that's one of kind of the, um, people get stuck on that, whether a podcast is journalism or not. Like for me, it always has been. And most of the shows I listen to are, are like, uh, inarguably journalism but i think because podcasting has this uh stigma to it where it's oh three guys in the basement getting drunk you know with dick and fart jokes yeah like that, you know that's kind there's of a lot of that. people there's, there's, there's a ton of that i think there's more of that than anything else right but yeah, a lot of people yeah. hear oh, a podcast is just is this it's just these these assholes you know saying really offensive things they're probably going to regret you know a couple of years later but but yeah there it definitely is a way to to do diy journalism and cover topics and and, and and people and artists and interviews with uh, you know any, anybody really who maybe isn't getting the the coverage necessarily that uh, maybe they should be for whatever it is that they're an expert on or whatever it is they're creating. Well, think about it like for in terms of music because this is a music podcast. Yeah. Um, man, we just don't get like even the reviews now are shorter and shorter. Like yep. to get a long piece in a magazine is tough. It's like a paragraph. Um, most reviews. It's just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, it's basically a plug. It doesn't really engage critically either anymore. Like there are very few websites that are doing like negative reviews of records. I don't really, I don't, I'm, I'm welcoming a bad thing here. No, no. Like, you know what? I, 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 I've, um, I've written reviews for a long time. I haven't done it in a few years, but I used to, for years and years, I wrote reviews for local publications, for online stuff, for stuff. And, and some of my favorite ones to write were, just absolutely savage ones if i just hated a record because if i just kind of liked a record it sucks if i really love it then that's yeah i can write for 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 days on that thing and explain exa every little bit of what i loved about it but I, but if it's something that's just like yeah it's okay it's it's hard it's hard to, <laughs> to kind of like sum that up more than just like a, a paragraph yeah. or two but if it's something you loathe something that just really gets you in a negative way and you, you want to turn off but you have to listen to it because you know this is the job that <laughs> those, those are often the best reviews i love reading those too when someone just really something about you know even if i made it i'd love to see someone just like you know rip it apart because it really is their honest opinion about it you know yeah i had a review uh um from this guy in edmonton my record love songs for the last 20 come out it's like love songs about places yeah and and uh the record came out uh 10 years ago and 
he kept going on and on about like the wretched pedal steel. Like he hated pedal steel guitar, right? This guy <laughs> just hated it. And it was like on as many, cause I was like, I'm in love with it. still am. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, he, he, he slammed that record. He's like, and like, and then slammed the songwriting. And I was like, I was pretty pissed about it. Cause it was like one of the first reviews I got. It was like an online review. And okay. I was like, I was dying to have reviews to share, like to have on my press sheet so I could get yeah, gigs. Yeah. And it was just like, it really, really hurt. But uh, I think more of us could, ha- more of us probably could handle a little bit more of that. Um, and the other thing it did, interestingly, is it galvanized a bunch of people for my benefit. Yeah, yeah. And for a bu- uh, to a bunch of people that say, like, there was a pile of comments on that review, on that review about like, how much of an idiot this guy was. <laughs> Um, not to say that he should have been called an idiot, um, but just that it, it really like galvanized those people's fan, fan, uh, uh, love of, of what I was doing. Yeah. Like they were like, no, I like this. Like, screw you. Like you, they, it, it didn't just offend me, you know, it, like it offended yeah. people that liked the record too. And, and they had then to defend it. And then in those defense, you you get reasons why they liked it, right? I'm sure you got all kinds of explanations of what was good about it. And you got, I got fans from that review. Yeah. Yeah. That's Um, cool. Yeah. And it's like the, the, the opposite thing. Uh, There are results to those things that you can't account for. You think it's just going to be negative. Let's yeah. It's not, not necessarily true. And, and uh, um, I mean, yeah, I, I can't imagine feeling lukewarm about something and writing a review for it. it. That would be it that sucks. would be the worst. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of that. I mean, you know, I honestly out of out of say a hundred reviews I've written over the years, yeah, a good seventy of them, I'm like, yeah, this is all right. You know, and then there's maybe you know another another twenty that I absolutely loved, and then ten that just just get killed me to listen to. I just couldn't handle it. And, and but those two extremes are the best to write about. But I think that just to kind of wrap this whole bit up here, I think that maybe the reason that it's harder to get those negative reviews now, or at least a, a thoughtful, um, honest review is because, because of the kind of influencer culture and someone is writing this review and they want whoever the artist is to share their review. So their followers can see this person's name and go to their website or go to their magazine or go to their blog or their podcast. And no one wants to step on anyone's toes because everyone's goal is sort of this weird clout that they want to get online. So you don't get people shitting on someone publicly. Yeah. Yeah just because I, they, that's, there's a that's fear exactly that seems exactly right I, I never i never tied that influencer culture to this issue but it seems like pretty obvious now <laughs> thank you <laughs> um yeah how 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 did we get here like how did we get to well, how do we get out of it where... is maybe a even a better question too right like i don't i don't think we can get yeah. back to you know, like I don't think you're going to see an absolutely savage review, even in something like like Rolling Stone, which has the luxury of being this you know well-established, long-running, high-profile publication. I don't think they're going to savage any records either. They might be give someone like a three stars or a two and a half or something, right? I think they would maybe like they would maybe slam like a Toby Keith. I think yeah, there might be yeah. some some places where they might take the liberty because it's somebody of like that stature, and if something really bad comes out from some massive star, they might they might cut him down. But that's the only thing I could see. Yeah, but they're not even uh, going to approach that honestly, though, right? I mean, if they get a record from that guy, there's going to be a preconceived notion coming into what he sounds like, what he what he you know politically represents, and everything, and it's kind of not even an, a fair review i mean I, I i don't like the guy's music but I, I would hope that if i was writing a review i would give it a kind of open-eared listen yeah i think I, I think I, I would love to try and do that just as an exercise that'd be an interesting one well I, i've actually thought um, about doing that um kind of as like an, an additional amount of content for the podcast but then my thought was like you know people could send me cds because i still listen to cds or tapes or vinyl or whatever yeah. and i could talk about them make a little video and and, and put it online but then there's that same problem. If someone's gone to the trouble of sending me this CD and, you know, I'm just some guy with a podcast and I just like excoriate, you know, <laughs> just, just completely destroy the record because I didn't like it. Like that's not, there's going to be, it's going to be an awkward situation, right? Because it's just some independent band that was kind enough to send me their music and wanted me to hear it because they legitimately wanted my opinion. Yeah. And then here I am, you know, absolutely tearing them down. So it's, it's kind of a, a tricky situation to, to, to manage, especially now. It is. We're just like, we have to be so, it's like, 
we have to be so careful of every footstep. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's, it's clear to me that this is another one of those examples of like, um, like this sort of, this sort of freedom of speech, uh, is, is maybe being clamped down in ways that I didn't really anticipate. And I'm not, I don't want to sound like a crazy right winger on <laughs> freedom of speech. I'm like the furthest thing from that, at least. Yeah. I can't imagine I people vote. mistaking you for one. Yeah. yeah. I hope not. But, but like, maybe there's a point there. It's not like it's intentionally happening or like legally happening, but like the way our culture is sort of pushing us to some level of conformity on certain things. I don't know. Maybe there's, maybe it's worth worrying about a little bit more. I don't know. Um, well, I, I think this is I, where the, the punk rockness of everything, if you can call it that sort of still comes in where there's still DIY communities. There's still yeah, hell people yeah. who have, who have like, you know, little photocopied zines that they sell to for, for a buck to 10 people and they're in their town, like, you know, and they've got record reviews of bands that no one's ever going to hear about. And so, and, and the internet definitely facilitates that. It definitely pushes um, the big mainstream stuff up, over and above everything else in an annoying way but you can find your pocket right yeah. you can find your little community like our little podcasting community here in manitoba you know yeah most of the shows in that group i, I love all those people but you know i don't think any of our shows are going to ever make it to millions of listeners big but that's not even the point so i think there's still yeah. you can still do it it's just not on a big level yeah and i think that like punk spirit would be sort of uh would be great to see more of that just people caring a little less yeah. about what people think. Well, it's almost caring more about the people that matter and caring less about what everyone outside of that feels. Yeah. I don't think it's because of a lack of like uh, overall care or like there's just certain people that you don't necessarily have to worry about their opinion and, and yeah. uh, realizing that you can't please everybody with your art. Like, well, you don't have to. Uh, why I'm, should you? Yeah. It's not going to be good no. if you please everyone. It's probably not going to have any kind of nuance to it. It's going to be no. the most ham, ham-fisted, you know, uh, yeah. lowest common denominator. Yeah. Well, and then likely if you intended to make that, it would no one would probably like it. Like I think making popular music at that level is probably really, really hard. Yeah, the, to succeed at yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like hooks that are that compelling and memorable, and lyrics that are that easy to 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 sort of like sing the first time you hear them. And like, I think there's an art to that, that I have, I just have no contact with. You need at least three and... Swedish guys to like <laughs> be writing books for you. <laughs> yeah. We got to hire the Swedes. Yeah. I think that's how it works. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this, this, this is a really great conversation and uh, this, we could talk about this forever, I think, but um, just kind of, you know, wrap things up here. What's the best sure. way uh, for people to find your music? I mean, obviously, you know, this being a podcast, someone could hear it six months from now, they could hear it next week the pandemic is going to obviously affect things as far as you playing shows and people being able to pick up your music, you know, in person directly from you, but what's the best option right now uh, to find your stuff and get your hands on it? I think um, the the best option for me is just go to my website, order the record or CD, um, or you can order digital downloads there um, and pay for them. Uh, That's, that is like the way I make money off this. Yeah. Make zero money from streaming, though, if that's what you do, you can get it there. Um, And then there's uh, all the other giant sites you can buy my stuff from through distributors like Amazon and everybody else. But Amazon doesn't need your money if you want to like... But they're spending it on spaceships, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's like superfluous flights that are just above the atmosphere. It's like... It's it's, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, It's... um, so like, you know, like if, you know, people, if, you, if you're going to take the time to buy a record, just go directly to someone's website or buy a record at a show and come see yeah. us, you know. Um, but like if people just want to check it out and they don't want to commit, just go and stream it and then commit after. You know, that's that's what I've been trying to do. Like I got into this this guy, Zephaniah O'Hara, and I was streaming his record for a month and I just bought all his vinyl. I yeah. just like just was the right thing to do and i was like i'd rather hear it i'd rather be able to like hold it anyway yeah but i was i just like found him and then i started listening to it and realized oh, i'm listening to this quite a bit i owe him some money now yeah just, for sure it just that's how it felt for me and i just i hope other people you need to have some relationship with music to realize how much work and time and money gets put into making records you know 
I've started doing that with Bandcamp. I, I, for the longest time, if I couldn't find something in person, I, I felt weird about ordering things online. I'd rather just buy it from a store because I have yeah. weird issues with uh, the internet, whatever. But um, I'm with you, man. Yeah. And so for the longest time, there were certain artists that, that were never going to come here. And, uh, you know, they were too small. They're, they're in some foreign country, whatever. They're making great music that I found, however, and I've been listening on Bandcamp for, for, for year, literally years in some cases. Yeah, and eventually yeah I'm on Bandcamp too. Bandcamp's great. Yeah. yeah. I eventually just put the bit the bullet and ordered the vinyl because I thought, you know, like this yeah. is something that I, I obviously like. I've been listening to it on their stupid Bandcamp page for, for years totally. now. I need to I need to do it. And I think there are a lot of people kind of doing that where they're realizing that like, yeah, I can play this as many times as I want on, on Spotify or whatever, or there's a merch button right there. I can buy tape or I can buy a record. So yeah, it's totally. hopefully there's more of a, more people like us out there. Yeah, I mean, it really helps. Like, it, it's it's huge. It's huge for us. So, anyways, yeah. Thanks again for having me on the show, man. Yeah, anytime, man. I'm always happy to talk to you. Oh, it's a pleasure.